Hello and welcome uh, to this webinar on Mental Health Act, race, ethnicity and the key issues for AMPS now. I'm Ruth Allen, I'm the Chief Executive of BASWA, British Association of Social Workers and uh, I'm kind of keeping time I think mostly and I've got an amazing array of people who are going to be speaking and sharing their thoughts um, and ideas um, with you and there will be time for discussion. Um, I'm actually just going to let uh, our first set of panelists and there are a few a couple more to, to join us but um i'd just like them to get a chance to say hello so if i just i'll call out your name and if you could just switch on your mics and say hello and i'll do it in the order that i can see people renee do you want to just say hello and say who you are hi um my name is renee Aliong and i'm a second year phd student at the university of york i'm also a social worker fabulous thank you mark you're next and my line. Hello everybody, my name is Mark Freewin. I'm the Mental Health Social Work Lead at the Department of Health and Social Care. I work in the Office of the Chief Social Worker and I have helped to organise this alongside Baswa and the AMP Leads Network. Ab. Imad, come to you. Hi, hi, uh, it's Imad Lilo. I'm the Vice Chair of the National AMP Lead Network and also a practising AMP and I've been having the pleasure of organizing this um, event. Thank you. And Husnara. Hi, my name's Husnara. I work um, as part of NHS England and Improvement, part of the National Mental Health Team, um, leading on the Qualities Programme for the Patient and Carers Race Quality Framework, which hopefully I'll have the pleasure to talk you through later on. Thank you. And Wayne? Good afternoon everybody, my name is Wayne Reid, I'm a professional officer and social worker. Um, I've worked in various areas of social work and I've kindly been invited this afternoon to speak about anti-racism in social work. Thank you Wayne. And Valbona. Hello, my name is Valbona Demili, I'm AMP and social care team lead in Reading. I'm a practice in AMP and BIA and social worker of course. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I would just I'd just like to run through a few practicalities before we get into the part of the um, session. Um, you, you should find on your screens on the right hand side um, a, a white and grey drop down box. If it's not open, you will see a little orange box with a white arrow. And if you click on that, uh, when it points to the right, you should have the screen opened um, or the box opened. And in that you will find um, some handouts. So the presentations and supporting documents are there. You should have four handouts which you can download and keep. Um, and also you will find um, the uh, function for you to put in questions. We would like you to use the questions box to provide questions for the panel. We really want this to be interactive and there will be two discussion slots um, of 20 minutes in the first and second half. Um, so please put your questions in there. Um, behind the scenes, keep an eye on chat. Um, that's also a place to put um, some comments, but also um, Jane, particularly who's in the background, Jane Shears, will be communicating with you um, through chat, um, but we'll also be picking up the questions and bringing them through for the panel to answer. Um, this session is recorded. Uh, we will be anticipating um, having a recording of this available. Um, but what we really need for you to now is to please participate through putting your questions forward. Um, a little bit about the background. Uh, indeed, I worked with Imad and Mark to plan this. Um, Imad uh, first raised this um, because of some, um, well, because this is a huge issue for us within social work. It's a huge issue, particularly for approved mental health professionals. Um, and this is an important webinar, and we see it as the start of ongoing conversations um, for BASWA, for the AMP Leads Network, for the Department of Health and Social Care through, through Mark's work with the uh, through the Office of Chief Social Workers and of course for, for all AMPs. Um, absolutely timely and imperative that we're talking about the implications of COVID uh, for uh, approved mental health professionals from black and minority ethnic uh, communities, but also obviously the impact it's having um, on people that we're working with. So um, we're going to explore this topic from an, all sorts of different 
angles, which I think is probably incredibly helpful, but will probably raise as many questions as answers, and we see this as an ongoing conversation. Um, and Basel, of course, is very, very pleased and keen to be supporting this. Uh, and we particularly support this through the work of our mental health uh, group, um, of which Imad um, is a part and Wayne uh, and Wayne supports. So, um, and Mark is also a part of that. So, um, really pleased uh, to, to be holding this. Um, one of the things we were discussing also was just about language. We will throughout use uh, the term, the shortening AMP for approved mental health professionals. So that's what we mean. We don't exactly know who the audience is. We know it's a really fantastically large audience and we think that we've got a real diversity of people in the audience, which is brilliant. So that should give rise to some diverse questions. So certainly we have AMPs online. Um, hopefully we also have um, people who use services, people who are in other parts of uh, mental health services, um, people who have an interest, carers and family members. So if you are in any of those kind of categories, we are really interested in your questions and we will all try to make sure that the language we use is as transparent and uh, accessible as possible. But we are going to use the term AMP because that's at the heart of what we're talking about. Um, so uh, we will say more at the end about sort of next steps and where we go with the themes that come out today. We don't we know what some of the themes might be. But really, the discussion that we have through your questions and between panel members will also be very important in determining next steps. Um, but we will say more um, at the end about that. Um, so I think that's it for my introductions. If you have any questions about anything technical, please ask Jane in the chat function um, and she can uh, pick that up if you have any issues. So. Um, with no, uh, no further comment from me at this point, I'm really delighted to hand over first to Imad, Imad Lilo, co-organizer and vice chair of the National AMP Leads Network. Thank you, uh, thank you um, again. Hello to everybody and thank you, Ruth. I am now going to provide an overview and set the scene. I have only seven minutes, so, I will be very succinct and brief by highlighting the issues and development which led us to holding today's special event. But I really would like to start as the vice chair of the network, the Amplied network, and on behalf of the network, to thank the AMP workforce for continuing to provide an excellent frontline service and upholding human rights on the face of extremely difficult working environments throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you and much, much, much appreciated. There have been developments over the past 10 to 15 years with a huge impact on race relations and race equality. In particular, the fight against terrorism, extremism and ra radicalization, although necessary, but has had an adverse impact on race relations. And Brexit, which has seen a rise of racist incident. And of course, more recently, the painful and sad killing of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. The Black Lives Matter movement brought to the surface explicitly this cancer in society, racism, and its manifestation, denying black people basic human rights, evidenced by the continued institutional racism within the NHS and social care. In relation to mental health and practice, which is the particular focus of today, we know that black people are more likely to receive poor service and outcomes from mental health services, with often very punitive measures when care and treatment provided, such as more likely to be sectioned under the Mental Health Act. Black people are also nine times more likely 
to receive community treatment orders. A legal order that requires a person to accept mental health treatment, including taking medication. Therefore, racial disparity in the use of the act is an ongoing injustice. This government acknowledged this back in 2017 and initiated an independent review of the Mental Health Act. And a year later, in 2018, the review published the findings and recommendations. The recommendations are independent by a commitment to modernize, review practices, and where appropriate, redesign roles such as that of ANAND, with the purpose to reduce detention rates and addressing racial disparity. Colleagues from the Department of Health, Mark and his colleagues, and, and, and from the Chief uh, Social Work Office, will update us later on the next steps of implementing the review recommendations. In the spirit of modernization, reviewing and evaluating our practice with a black mental health service user, service users and to support black AMS, I recommended at the most recent AMP lead conference back in July, the establishment of a black and ethnic minority AMP forum. Now, I'm, I am really, really delighted to share with you fantastic news that this has been actioned. We have worked so hard in such a short time and have already established the Black and Ethnic Minority Amp Forum. The aim of which is to address, promote and champion the needs and rights of a Black and Ethnic Minority Amps service users and communities. AMPs who are interested to join this new forum, please send your expression of interest to me directly um, via email or a Twitter as, sh as shown on the slide. Please, next slide. Yes, these are my details. Please send your expression of interest directly to me by email or Twitter. I will elaborate on the aim and objectives of this group later at the panel session. Before I hand over to the next speaker, to summarize, racism is a disease that can kill a human being directly, as we have seen and witnessed with George Floyd and so many others or indirectly and its lifelong impact on our physical and mental health well-being. The rage we are seeing now via Black Lives Matter has been burning for a long, long time. Anger, anger at why systemic racism continues to the present day. And of course, Black people are more likely to die of the current pandemic, COVID-19. I would like to finish by stating, although it's difficult to separate race from politics, but race equality is a basic human right we are all entitled to. Thank you, and I hope this unique and special event brings us all together to find racism, promote equality, harmony, and peace. Of course, with the overall aim to improve outcomes for Black and ethnic minority mental health service users. Thank you and much appreciated. Thank you. Over to you, Ruth. Thanks, Emad. Thank you. Um, we'd like to move straight on to um, Mark. Um, and his, his uh, short presentation. Mark. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth. That's really kind of you. And thank you, Emad, for that great introduction there. Um, if you could go to my one slide, please, Stephanie. 
Thank you. So um, it'll be a great joy to everyone that I'm only going to have one slide and I'm going to talk for a very short period of time because I know we've got some brilliant speakers coming on later on and I don't want to use up any time. But I just wanted to just to give an overview <clears throat> because obviously this is a hugely important issue as both Ruth and Emad have said and something that I personally am very committed to and I'm working on behalf of the chief social workers and I know that they are also very committed to this as well. So from our point of view, what we want to do is to take this opportunity to be able to support and develop the role of the AMP um, and within that to be able to support the AMP workforce, but also take advantage of any opportunities we've got to develop the role of the AMP and uh, particularly around this issue uh, around race equality and the, the needs and work of both black and ethnic minority AMPs and also the people that we serve as well. I'd like to start uh, as well by, by, like Emad, by thanking the workforce. One of the great privileges that I've had over the last few months is to be able to see uh, the input that AMP services are having across the country and particularly to feed into the Minister of State for, for Health and Social Care and his team in relation to the Mental Health Act easements and one of the reasons why the decision was recently taken not to follow up those Mental Health Act easements was a recognition of both the role of mental health that trusts but also the role of amp services as well and it's important we recognize that now the chief social workers office um, is working very hard at the moment on a number of issues that are very relevant to this one of these is the development of a workforce race equality framework um, specifically for social work and social care now, obviously, this is a lot wider than the AMP role, but one of the things we want to do is to link AMPs into it and to make sure that all AMPs have access to this and are able to participate in the development of this service. And that, of course, is very linked to the existing NHS uh, race equality framework. And as somebody who took part in the Mental Health Act review, I was very struck by the challenge that the Mental Health Act review and, and particularly the service users who took part in that gave to us as leaders and participants in and social care around the role of the AMP and particularly around the need to protect the human rights of people at the point of assessment possibly for detention under the mental health act but also before that as well to try and avoid people going into hospital and to try and avoid people being subject to the powers of the mental health act so there's a real issue for me around how amps review and work with their power and their role to be able to um to respond to that challenge. Now, one of the ways in which we can do this is working through NHS England. And so we've got Husnara coming on later on, who's going to talk about the PCREF, the Patient uh, and Carer Race Equality Framework that came out of the Mental Health Act Review. Very important that AMPs are involved in that. But also, we want to go wider and think about um, the role of the AMP and how we need to develop that expertise in order to be able to look at um, uh, the, the prevention issue of trying to stop people from getting to that point where detention under the Mental Health Act is inevitable. So part of the ways that we can do that is to work with the opportunities that we've got coming up. One of those opportunities is the development of the Mental Health Act review. Now I happen to know that the Civil Service Mental Health Act team is currently being brought together to review the Mental Health Act, which has been um, put on hold, if you like, by coronavirus. And now they would like to get the white paper for the Mental Health Act uh, ready by the end of this year. And so we've got an opportunity to influence that as well. Um, and we've also got an opportunity with Social Work England to look at AMP training and the development of the AMP role as Social Work England takes over the uh, regulation, both of a large number of AMPs, but also working with the other regulators, those AMPs who are OTs and nurses, and also the training and development roles for AMPs as well. So I'd like to end this slot just by saying that, you know, we are in a unique position to be able to uh, work to develop and support AMPs as practitioners, their health and well-being, but also the role of the AMP in looking after the people that we assess under the Mental Health Act and work with as part of mental health services and lots of the speakers coming up are going to be able to give much more detail on how we might do that so i'm going to stop here and hand over to the next speaker and thank you very much to all of you who have attended today and listening to this debate
Thank you. Um, thanks to you, Madam Mark, for that those fantastic, fantastic overview, that sense of optimism um, and action um, being taken um, that uh, I hope we will explore further. And uh, I'd like to now come um, to Valbona Demiri, who is an AMHP AMP and social care team leader, um, I think in Reading Council, um, and uh, bringing it to life from the work that you're doing day, day in, day out in your role, Valbona. Welcome. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm going to, to talk about an AMP perspective in regards to, to the issues that uh, other people talked before. And I might not be able to cover everything um, because I have limited time. I have sent uh, some further information. <laughs> so I'll start by, by the same thing that any AMP actually starts the, their work by asking why individuals from ethnic minorities, especially African, Caribbean, and Asian uh, heritage are still overrepresented in detentions, maybe now for 30 years or, or even longer. And everybody knows this, um, but still there is no resolution. And all of us as AMPs ask these questions to ourselves every time. And we think, why do we make the application? It has to be acknowledged that we as SAMS become involved with someone, when we become involved with someone, is in mental health crisis. So we are the sharpest end of the mental health service provision. We acknowledge that detention under the Mental Health Act takes away an individual's liberty and imposes treatment to people that they don't want sometimes, which can be traumatic and very frightening. On the other hand, we do understand and we do know that this care and treatment, it can help to restore health and even can be life-saving. Some accounts of the service users from the mental health act review are very, very difficult uh, to hear. Um, especially for us, because we are the less professionals involved with them, and we are the ones who make the application, not, not the detention, but we make the application. So I would like all of us to take this as an opportunity and powerful prompt to change and improve both locally and nationally the mental health services and what we do in order to reduce the detentions and improve the mental health provision for ethnic minority groups, especially from those who are overrepresented on detention. So how do we use the powers to uphold human rights? Because that is our role as an AMP. On our involvement as an AMP from the beginning when a referral is made, we do think and remind ourselves about the structural inequalities, social injustice, discrimination and racism that exist in our society. And we know that those and socioeconomic factors, those are the ones that actually have an impact on someone and can lead to mental health crisis or developing a mental illness. We also are aware about the stigma that is attached to mental health and provision or someone being in contact with mental health services. So from the start, we do explore when we get the referral, all the information, we scrutinize the information that we receive that to ensure that this is not based on any prejudice, that is not based on any presumptions, that in order for us from the start to protect human rights and not to intervene in someone's life when it's not needed. If we were to decide to go for the full me for mental health act assessment, because that is needed, again, we ensure that the assessing team is balanced. What I mean by that in regards to these particular ethnic minorities, we 
ensure to have the right assessing team that can match with those ethnic minorities. We look at any other factors uh, that might enable this individual to fully engage and participate in the assessment. We do engage with them and listen to the trauma, listen to their what they've gone through their life uh, because they would have been discriminated or they would have gone through trauma or many, many other problems. We give them an opportunity to talk about those and validate their distress, validate this social injustice and try to understand their experiences from the social perspectives. So we have to ensure that uh, the assessment is legal as well. And at the end, we have to validate and all the information we have and to make a decision. And sometimes, sadly, they are in the position that we do not have any other options. There are no least restrictive choices for us to use, but to make an application for someone to be detained under the Mental Health Act. Those are not decisions that we make very lightly. Those are uh, decisions that we think um, too much about those. And we have ethical dilemmas. Do not think this because we do not, want, we do not want to add to detention statistics, not wanting to deprive someone of their liberty, not wanting to add another label to someone knowing that the care and treatment that they will receive is not the best and maybe not appropriate for that group. We have still to make a decision. As I said, it will be, of course, legal, but more moral and ethical decision because we cannot leave another human being in that distress. We need to do something about that. And sometimes, as I said, it, it, it can be only make an application for someone to be uh, treated and admitted into mental health uh, psychiatric hospitals. Now I'm going to, and, and again, it needs to be acknowledged that actually all the reasons are the reasons that are the reasons that someone develops the mental illness are outside BAMS. Uh, and as I said, it is, they, 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 we see them when they are uh, in mental health crisis. And if you are not going to make a decision uh, or to make an application, you will be adding to the discrimination perhaps by depriving them, withholding from them this service that can make a difference. I'm going to talk now in regards to how we can contribute to the changes. As Mark was saying, we as some workforce would be able to make, to make some changes. We are leaders or, on our own rights and we can make differences every day. Alberta, you've just got about okay. a minute. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. So, so those differences, we can make it uh, locally and nationally and we can get more involved in preventative work. We can work more closely with all organizations in order to eradicate the discrimination and racism and improve the social and economic factors of an individual. Also an improvement of the workforce to represent all communist, ethnic communities locally and nationally. Thank you. Well, Bernard, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd like now to come on to uh, Hosnara Malik, uh, Programme Manager from National Health uh, Service uh, from NHS uh, E and NHS I, and I'll let you describe more detail what you do, Hosnara. Thank you very much for joining us, talking um, about the patient and, and care race equality framework. Excellent. Thank you, Ruth, and uh, thank you so far for everyone's um, introduction, uh, really in terms of their presentation. So hopefully I'd like to go through um, in my presentation slides um, in regards to um, where this all come about, really, the patient and care race equality framework, hopefully giving you a quick summary of what 
um, the patient care race quality framework is or the PCREF as it's known so I'm going to refer to my slides as the PCREF as, as the acronym um, and then hopefully um, draw attention to what NHS England and improvement have been doing um, in terms of next steps um, so yes I work very very quickly and I said this in my introduction so I work part of the national Men mental health team very much leading on the qualities program alongside Dr Jackie Dyer who may or may not be uh, on the call and she is the chair for the advancing mental health equalities task force where we have a number of our members who are external and internal members including our experts by experience helping us develop the PCREF um, so if you don't mind going on to the next slide um, Stephanie Thank you. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail of this. This is just very much an extract of where uh, the recommendations were made. So uh, this has obviously been touched by um, EMAD and, and Mark um, in their presentation. But as you know, the independent review uh, of the Mental Health Act uh, was undertaken in the context of, of, of um, rising detention rates, um, in particular with, with black um, people being four times more likely, as we know, to be sectioned uh, than their white uh, British counterparts in England. And obviously, Addressing this uh, disproportionality was a key focus of that review. Um, and so what we do know is uh, with the evidence on the reasons for this and looking at um, how to reduce those detention rates, the experts by experience and the participants involved in the review um, very much made um, highlights around actually black and ethnic uh, minority groups are less likely to engage with um, upstream mental health services as an example. Um, we know from presentations that we've just heard so far that the poor experience of the black, Asian, minority, ethnics, uh, patients and carers in mental health services perpetuates a cycle of mistrust um, and fear. Uh, <clears throat> again, we know that. Um, and then of course we know the causes of those poor experiences certainly do vary up and down the country uh, with multiple factors uh, being cited around a lack, a lack of cultural awareness in mental health services, um, the impacts of systemic racism, um, again permeating all parts of life which includes uh, mental health services, you know, poor relationships between mental health services and local communities, um, and again, as we've heard, around poor, poor service, and, uh, poor services, and poor service outcomes that again lead to poor experiences and even further uh, racial disparities. Um, so again, these issues have compounded and resulted in Black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities presenting at a point um, of crisis and having those racialized experiences, which again, which often results in sectioning and again perpetuates that cycle of fear and mistrust. And so what the review ended up doing is include a number of recommendations. And one of those main recommendations were for NHS England and NHS Improvement to develop what we call an organisational competency framework. Um, and that is about systematically improving the cultural awareness and responsiveness of mental health services. Um, and so what the framework is termed as, as we know, is the patient and carers race quality framework, the PCREF, um, and what we also know is since obviously COVID and the global movement, this has certainly shown a light um, even more in advancing mental health inequalities. Um, so if you don't mind moving to the next slide. So how does the PCREF look like in reality? So the PCREF itself is broken into three components. Um, and one of the first components is very much addressing the, I guess, statutory and regularity requirements that we all know organisations should be complying. And again, we've heard that uh, touched upon by our uh, presenters um, just now. So again, I'm not going to go through all of these, but the expectation as, as, we, as we might know it is, you know, right from the very level of our Human Rights Act to our Equality Duties Act, public sector duties, um, when we think about the use of force acts for mental health units, um, nice guidelines, uh, gu guidance uh, rather, um, the workforce race equality standards, which you know we're going to be hearing presentation later on, and the CQC inspection criteria around when led. Um, these are some of the um, statutory and regularity obligations that we expect to see uh, from our, our um, organisations, combined with the NHS plans and some of the supporting commissioning tools that are out there. So that includes obviously the NHS long-term plans, the NHS England's long-term plans, the NHS England's mental health implementation plan, alongside 
um, I guess, working well together, which is a toolkit that was uh, um, uh, produced around co-production in commissioning um, and things like improving access to psychological therapies, uh, positive practice guides for, for black, Asian, minority, ethnic um, service users and older people. So those are, that's the first part of the component. And it's really about making sure that we work with organisations to look at it from a lens of how are they improving those racialized experiences for black, Asian, minority, ethnic, when they are you know, fulfilling their statutory and regularity um, obligations. The second part of um, PCREF is very much about our national um, competencies that we all very much know about already. And this is really about strengthening those competencies and improving opportunities for black, Asian, minority, ethnic um, experiences. So for example, these competencies well known around co-production, co-learning, workforce, um, staff knowledge and awareness, leadership and governance, the use of data and monitoring, partnership working, cultural awareness services, information and advice, digital inclusion, the list can go on. Um, and these are obviously well-known competencies um, that organisations um, are required to obviously um, embed as part of their practice. What the PCREF um, is, is requesting is to really look at improving on these national competencies from a racialised um, lens. Uh, and that is about making sure how are these competencies improving those experiences of black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities? And the very heart of what we're trying to do in PCREF is making sure that we are, of course, working very closely with our experts by experiences, our patients, our carers, in a collaborative way in order to try and develop a plan which incorporates those, those national um, competencies. And, and some of those competencies are probably on a local level as well, that's local to um, those specific areas and those specific communities that we need to work with organisations to consider how has that been embedded. And then the third part of, of the PCREF is very much a tools assessment and that is around looking at a patient and carer's feedback mechanism and that is making sure again that the voice of the patient and carers is, is heard, listened to and that we are um, looking at um, evaluating the PCREF at the point that we have launched this and worked with organisations to ensure that they are being of course accountable in demonstrating the evidence of how they are uh, producing this. Um, an example that I could provide you as, as I talked on sorry, and just to go slightly back. So the example could be around co-production, for example, in terms of what good looks like as a national competency. Um, it could be around being treated as an equal partner in improving my racialized experiences when it comes to decision-making. Um, and some of the evidence that we would expect our organizations to demonstrate is the questions around, has co-production really contributed in delivering better experiences for black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities. And that's really about organizations making sure that they can demonstrate and evidence how they've worked those communities specifically um, in, in respect of that. And then it's of course, working with organizations to say, how can they improve those competencies? And what are those key measures that we may already be recording nationally, or that we may want to look at the local measures that they're recording to try and evidence how they are supporting and improving those experiences. Um, so, so those are the three components in terms of where we are. Um, no, about a minute, oh, thanks. Thank you. Oh, did you finish? <laughs> sorry. Oh, have I? Sorry. I hope I didn't cut across you too much there. <laughs> have you finished? Can I, ca uh, can I carry on? I just said you had about a minute, but if you could just wind up, oh, that I've would got be that's great. It. Fantastic. Yeah. I will wrap it up. Sorry, I didn't hear you say I've got that to me. I thought you said just that's it. Um, so I was going to go, OK, I'll be quiet. Right. So I've got a minute. Um, just to wrap it up very quickly, where are we in NHS England improvement? We are carrying out an intensive engagement programme um, as we speak now. Um, and it's really, really critical that we continue to engage <laughs> with patients, carers, NHS staff in understanding um, what um, the racialized experiences have been and where we can look to improve. We, we can't achieve this without having you know, those voices heard. So we are very much on the listening mode um, of, look, of, of obviously developing that. So what we will be doing is rolling out a number of webinar series. We'll be looking to hold and roll out a national survey sometime next year. Um, and that will all form part of hopefully developing 
um, much closer in terms of coming up with with a patient uh, and care race equality framework and what's really critical is obviously we're very pleased to be working very close with the department of health and social care in ensuring that amp is part of that um, in helping us shape uh, the PCREF um, as we go on so i hope that's okay that's it Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm sorry to cut people a little short, but uh, there's so much to say, so much to get through. So we'd like to now turn to um, some questions. Um, and I'm going to take, uh, and panellists, you can you can see some of the questions. So there may be something that you want to address. And if so, just please speak out. We want to make this quite free flowing. Um, I'm going to go to quite a sort of concrete question that came in um, from uh, Ross. Um, and this is, I think this, this is about the, um, the Mental Health Act review and papers being ready at the end of December. Um, I suppose a little bit more about when we can expect to see what in relation to the Mental Health Act uh, review. So if we just start with that, it's quite a concrete question, but um, we'll come on to some others in a moment. Mark, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. Yeah, thank you very much, Ross, for that question. Um, the paper that I was referring to is the Mental Health Act Review White Paper. So this is the first stage of a parliamentary process. Um, the Mental Health Act Review was finished in December 2018. Obviously, it's been delayed, as everything has, by COVID. And the idea is to uh, review it <clears throat> and to work on it um, this year and hopefully to have something ready to go to Parliament by the end of the year. So the white paper is the first stage, then there's a whole parliamentary process of reviewing uh, the new legislation and it's expected to be completed over the next few years. Obviously, I can't possibly say how long that will take, but the white paper is the first stage of that process. So what will be written down is um, a presentation as to how the new Mental Health Act will look um, having been reformed and developed by the review by Professor Sir Simon Wesley. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'd like to go now, if that's okay, with all to a wider question, and several of you may have things to say about this, um, from Balvinda, about um, it's saying that integrated services and multidisciplinary teams were seen as essential in national service framework and deinstitutionalisation in the 80s and 90s, probably a bit after that. And a view about what the impact has been on the social model with the breakdown in some integrated mental health teams. Um, and I guess to relate that to our objective here, which is to improve anti-oppressive, anti-racist practice and understanding of social context and uh, social disadvantage, which is kind of, I think, for me, it's probably sitting behind that question. Don't want to put words in anybody's mouth. But any thoughts from the panel? Who who'd like to 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 pick up on on that? Any thoughts on that? I'm I'm happy to. Could uh, I go to maybe I could go to Emad on on yeah. the whole issue of integrated teams? I, well, <clears throat> I personally did a, a national research on integration and um, integration and um, its benefits to. Um, service users from all ethnic minorities is 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 imperative having said that uh, since the publication of my research about three to four years ago now uh, we've, we've 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 witnessed a lot of um, organization basically um divorcing um but i, I nothing has been done as far as i know re in relation to um, researching them or, or a survey of, of, of what has happened. I don't know, Mark, whether you've got any update in relation to these divorces. Um, yes, it's a very good question, this. Um, <clears throat> and it's something that I have been working on very closely with uh, Karen Lind, who, uh, who, who, who like uh, Ruth, has worked on the Social Work for Better Mental Health project and has gone around and, and explored, I think, 72, isn't it now, Ruth, um, different areas who have examined and reviewed their integrated arrangements. Um, so there are a number of issues here. One is that, yes, people are divorcing. And yes, bad divorces between integrated partners can very much affect uh, a range of issues. However, 
it isn't all bad news. There is still um, quite a substantial proportion of people who are working in partnership across the country. And a lot of people are reviewing their partnership arrangements. And sometimes these partnership arrangements need to be reviewed because the systems that we set up in the early noughties are not necessarily fit for purpose now with the CARE Act, uh, with all of the, the new Mental Health Act, with the effects of austerity. Um, and so sometimes it's a good thing to review people's integrated relationships. I think one of the things that we are saying very strongly is that relate is that we should while we should review integrated partnerships um, we need to do it from the point of view of strength-based practice of making sure that the social and medical model are balanced with each other of a, a mutual respect of a partnership of equals between health and social care what we don't approve of necessarily is uh, organizations splitting together uh, in a very um, unhelpful way and there being differences of opinion and arguments around the way that services should be run. So we're not necessarily worried about change, um, but we want that change to be constructive and about modernising and thinking. And so this is an opportunity. If we want to make services more appropriate for people from black and ethnic minority backgrounds and diverse communities, then we might need to review the way that we operate them. A great opportunity to do this is the community mental health framework, which is being led um, like the PCREF by um, NHS England, but which is also a huge opportunity for local authorities and voluntary sector organisations and community groups to get involved and work in partnership. Thank you. I wondered if, yeah, Bob Bowen, I was going to come to you. Yes, please do come in. Yeah, uh, we, we in Reading have the first hand experience of that. We, in 2008, August, um, we, since then, we haven't been working as an integrated team. The local authority has taken all the social care uh, professionals and staff back to the local authority. And we do see some uh, very positive outcomes. Uh, we do feel more valued, we do feel that we are more independent into our, everything what we do and that includes decision making. We do feel and believe that we are making a better difference in regards to what we do as mental health social care uh, professionals. We are purely um, providing and uh, social social care, uh, social work interventions. We are able to engage more better with people. We use different models, and one of them currently is the conversation model, which is widely used. And that is a strength-based approach, which is enabling all us as professionals to, to work very closely with, with individuals and not necessarily look at the symptoms not necessarily look at the medication, which when we are part of the integrated team, we were in some ways kind of forced to, to, to look more into the med medical model and to concentrate on, on that. So that there are positives in, in, in working differently as well. Thanks, Marbona. I, I, was, uh, I, I was, was just going to... Yes, yeah, sorry, Matt. Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, maybe Hisnara might have a, a comment as well about the relationship between the PCREF and integrated working. But shall I come I, to you first, Imad, and then I'll come over to yeah. you, Hisnara? The, 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 the outcome and experiences differ, and it all depends on how the divorce is being planned, organised, and how workforce supported. So some divorces, right, correct, as Mark and 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 as I said, they've been positive, but others are not. So it's a mixed bag so far. Yeah, thank thanks, Ms. Nara, I was thinking maybe about how um, obviously you're working particularly on a framework that is which is lodged squarely within the NHS, but it has to work for the whole system. And I wonder how you think about that. You know, what what difference do we make to the experience of Black and minority ethnic people using services? Um, if we've got lots of different, if we've got if we've got lots of systems um, of assurance, I mean, how do we make them work together? How do we know that ultimately people are getting more anti-oppressive, anti-racist um, approaches I mean, to their schools, for instance? 
I mean, that's a really good point, Ruth. What we do have in our um, PCREF governance is we've got a number of our um, uh, trust partners who are piloting the PCREF. Um, and one of them, I believe, is an integrated trust or has integrated services within within their services. And what we are doing is testing um, the PCREF with their carers, patients base and staff base to look at the evidence and see what difference that would make. So as it stands now, it's very early days for us to, to know what that evidence is. We know we lack the evidence and this is the reason why it's really critical that we carry out that intensive engagement to understand what that evidence is. And we'll know a bit more. I mean, we've got phased approaches to do this, but we'll certainly know by 2021, early 2021, um, what the difference looks like in terms of integrated services and those that stand alone. And we hope to come back and hopefully demonstrate that evidence and that feedback. And then how does that permeate into the PCREF in terms of when we look at the competencies around workforce, which we know will look very different from you know, different organisations' perspective. Um, and it's about making sure we get that right for the organisations, um, but it's also making sure that the organisations understand that and how they feed that into making sure that they can improve those experiences for those communities. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I know that's a bit of a long-winded answer, but it's too premature at this stage for us to be able to say that, but we are aware um, that that could look very different in terms of integrated services. Uh, I'm going to go to another question from the audience, but it's just making me think we haven't really talked about culture, as in the culture of organisations and the, the stuff, the taken for granted stuff that's, that kind of permeates and how well that serves change and a move towards, you know, reducing levels or eliminating discrimination and improving diverse outcomes. Um, I just thought maybe that's something we can come back to. Um, <laughs> I just want, there's a, a kind of short time, we've got a very interesting question here from Omar asking about um, how is the increased power dynamic, um, the powers that come from being an AMP, has that being addressed in terms of power relations where you have a white social worker working with people from black ethnic minority communities? How are um, black and ethnic minority service users, people using services supported in relation to that, that, that power dynamic? So um, kind of much, something much more in the heart of that, of the interaction and, and the practice. And I wondered who, whether anybody would like to 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 pick uh, pick pick that up and, and I've got you're also haven't spoken yet but might have want to uh, want to also contribute I don't know Ren, Rene might be good to do that because that's part of her um, research I think is that is that very issue yeah sorry to drop you in it there Rene no 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 I was listening and I was thinking that is exactly my research is looking at cultures, looking at the taken for granted things. So, yeah, when I speak about my research, I'm going into the two AM service teams and sort of a fly on the wall sort of, you know, sort of research to just look at things other than policies and procedures to see how work is actually done and to kind of pick up those anomalies between policy and practice. So I'll speak a lot about that um, when it's time for me to just kind of talk about my research, but I'll be looking at that sort of thing as well. Thanks. Thank you, Rene. And that and that, that that point also in that question about specifically that the power imbalance that is just inherent by who's in the room together. I think that was what was sort of kind of behind the um, the question as well. I think I think that will probably come through also in your presentation, Rene. And, um, with that. Would, would anybody like to pick up on that? Rabona, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say in regards to LAMPs, although we are independent and we make that decision independently, we work in teams and we do lots of reflection, lots of discussions between ourselves about the ethnic minorities. We would have in our team someone from for example, Black African or someone uh, from Asian background, and we would discuss openly those, the differences in cultures, trying to understand different cultures. And during the assessment, for example, as you're saying, the power that becomes with the number role and more specific if it's an, uh, an white camp assessing a, um, someone from ethnic minorities, Again, is that open discussions that the AMP will have uh, during the assessment, saying we are different. I want to try to understand your culture and and, and that discussion and and what um, 
specifically how, how that individual presents. And also in the, assess, in the assessment, we usually have to have two doctors. Usually we would like to get someone from that community from that, that again, can make this individual as comfortable as possible and balance the, the, the power dynamics and everything. Thanks, Barbara. And it's about the whole issue of having a diverse team, of having that com that diverse that diversity of conversation is so crucial, isn't it? Because yes, yes, yes. that's how that's how that's one of the, one of the crucial things we need to ensure. Um, we, we've, we've come to the end of this first session. We're due to take a break at this time. There are a few more questions, but I think what I would like to do is try and stick to time um, and and take our break now. It's just a five minute break, just for anybody to stretch legs. And then we will come back to those some of those questions that we've got um, from the audience because they, they can uh, run forward to the afternoon. And, and uh, most but not all of our uh, colleagues here are staying with us uh, for the rest of the session. Some others are joining. Can I just thank you all so much for your presentations? And uh, can I ask participants to um, come back um, ready to join again at uh, one, uh, one minute past two? Exactly five minutes. I'll see you very shortly. Thank you. Thank you. New, newly refreshed panel. Hello. Hello, Hello um, participants. Um, um, really pleased to move into the second part um, for even more perspectives on all of these issues. Um, and uh, first up is uh, Natasha, Natasha Sloman, uh, who, who's currently Director of Quality Healthcare in um, uh, Quality in the Priory Group. And is a former CQC head of hospital inspection in mental health and was an AMP lead for a very long time um, and lots of experience. So, Natasha, thank you very much for fighting your way through the technology. And it's yeah. a delight to have you here. So, thanks very much. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and the subject matter, well, I, I think I'm probably just going to give some reflections um, on anti-oppressive practice and accountability um, because when I read the title of the presentation um, it just made me sit back and really think and reflect about well what does that mean to me um, as a social worker. Um, I'll be honest with you, after all, that's a core theme for accountability. Um, I even had a bit of a mild panic uh, sort of thinking about it. I'm not quite sure why, but um, after all, we've all come across oppressive practices uh, throughout our professional lives. Um, and for me, anti-oppressive practice uh, is partly about our ability uh, to identify social inequalities and um, injustices and do everything possible uh, to shift power back to those who need it most. Um, as a teenager, I had my own experiences uh, of a social worker who not only had a profound and positive impact on my life, um, but on my sense of identity and belief uh, in what I could achieve in the future. Um, this social worker uh, simply reflected to me what my strengths were. Uh, this social worker helped me look beyond my circumstances of poverty uh, and some social deprivation. And this social worker, uh, he got me a job and he helped me to believe that I was bright and I was capable and most importantly what that social worker told me as a teenager was you don't need me um, and it's a salient reminder that we don't foster dependencies uh, and we help to really pave the way uh, to self-empowerment. So I think at the heart of our profession are the core beliefs that we can and will do everything uh, to ensure that an individual's rights are protected. And in mental health, we really have had uh, the privilege of being at the forefront uh, as a profession to not only change oppressive practices within mental health, uh, and ins but ensure that really good practice is adhered to. 
a code of practice uh, narrative where whether it's in the form of a book that gathers dust on a shelf or is unread online is absolutely inert uh, unless we ensure that it translates positively uh, for the people that we work with. We all know that psychosocial triggers contribute significantly to poor mental health outcomes and it's heartening to see the evidence base catching up with us as a profession. Um, and I think that we've managed to quietly, well, maybe not always quietly, um, and unobtrusively sort of sidle into mental health services and take our rightful place uh, in the spectrum of mental health professionals. In the last decade in particular, there's been a growing awareness uh, of the importance of capacity, uh, the protection of basic rights, the absolute need to be culturally and ethnically aware, and the importance to care socially. Um, these things are enshrined in the law, um, and that's all very well, um, but the practitioners who implement these laws um, must do so correctly um, and in a way that is empathic because that's actually what really, really counts. And I believe that one of our core duties as social workers is the importance um, to always spot, highlight, challenge, escalate, and really raise our hands and be counted uh, where we see things that are just not right. So, as a head of inspection at CQC, um, I did have the privilege of sort of getting to know a number of large mental health trusts. And it's really important to highlight that actually those that were rated as outstanding really understood the importance of non-hierarchical structures where people who use um, services were quite rightly uh, the absolute center of everything that that trust did. Um, these organisations were aware of the need to redress the imbalance of power that exists uh, within mental health services, and they developed platforms um, of human rights, which of course included things like uh, reducing restrictive practices. Um, they involved people fully in decision making, and they really forged strong, culturally sensitive links with local communities and created opportunities for people to be linked in, to be connected, um, to look and engage in meaningful employment. Um, they were absolutely committed uh, in all cases to addressing inequalities and they had really, really strong strategies uh, in place to do this. And finally, they had genuine and really resonant engagement with carers and families. Uh, who are frequently marginalised um, by statutory services. But of course, we as social workers, we know this already because this is what we have brought to the fore, what we have absolutely advocated for uh, since we became uh, very much part uh, of those services. Um, but we can't crow, um, maybe a little bit, because humility is also a real strength uh, of social work um and we we need to be humble if we can really um ensure that we're there helping people and giving back the power that is in, we've been you know kind of foisted upon us i know many of our social workers think we don't want to use this power that we have but it's so important that actually we're very very cognizant of the power that we hold and we're always redirecting that to the people who need it most. So that's all I really wanted to say. I know that's very short and sweet and it's a bit, you know, reflective. Um, but coming back to spending that time reflecting on what does anti-oppressive practice mean to you um, is absolutely essential. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Natasha, thanks. Thank you very much. That's why I invited you. I wanted, I thought, the uh, reflective approach to, you know, the things that you've worked on, you've seen, you, you know, you've experienced is really 
uh, what we all need, and we need it as social workers. Um, and those of us who have either been or are amps need it as well to really reflect on our on our practice and how we use our power. So thank you very much for that. That's really pertinent and really helpful. Um, I'd um, like to go to Wayne, Wayne Reed, Professional Officer in Basra. Um, thanks, uh, uh, Wayne, for, for joining us. Um, over to you on promoting anti-racism anti in social work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me. So um, I'd like to speak about uh, anti-racism in social work. It's actually broader than that, and I think the presentation is perhaps uh, relevant to other professionals also. Uh, I know AMPs can also have, uh, of course, you know, they come from other professional backgrounds, they're not all social workers, so uh, I would hope that uh, this will resonate with um, most people on some level. Um, I also want to um, mention that this presentation is aimed at uh, practitioners and managers as opposed to uh, the racism that service users face. Of course, that's relevant, uh, but this this presentation really is focusing on the impact for um, black and ethnic minority professionals um, and the professionals from all, all levels, really. Okay, uh, next slide, please. The one after that, thank you. So the perspective that I come at this um, this presentation from is that um, racism is of course is personal and professional for me um, so there are elements of my opinion in here and things that I feel should happen or that are happening um, that aren't necessarily reflective of, of Basra although they have been very uh, supportive in terms of all of this work that I've done I do like to make that distinction that some of this really you know is, is my own opinion um, there's also a point I'd like to make about um, there being very few black male social workers. So this perspective is very much a minority within a minority perspective, but to some degree uh, in terms of that. Um, my views aren't representative of all black uh, and ethnic minority professionals or people. We're not a homogeneous uh, group, so I like to make that point. Um, I'm also not the tokenistic voice of Baswa, uh, which I say slightly tongue-in-cheek, given that my boss is here, you know, um, but uh, that is the kind of position, really, that uh, I'm not a spokesperson for Baswa. A lot of this, really, as I say, is personal and professional, and I'm trying to sort of be as authentic as I can be. Um, and finally, some of the uh, proposals that I make here are around organisational development and leadership, of which I have no real kind of uh, professional experience. But what I do have is lived experience, both personally and professionally as a black guy. And that's sort of what I bring to the table uh, with this. Um, hopefully the images at the bottom um, illuminate um, the direction in which this presentation will, will go. So next slide, please. This is uh, a brief um, overview of some of the work streams that myself and Baswa uh, and the rest of my team have been involved in over the last few months. Um, we issued a, a statement around the murder of George Floyd uh, and also the Baswa position in terms of um, anti-racism, anti-discriminatory um, and anti-oppressive practice and some of our plans and proposals going forward to uh, address that both internally and across uh, social work. Um, we also supported different campaigns, one of which was uh, a statue um, for a black person to be uh, erected in Bristol. Uh, there's been the KCMG campaign, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, the KCMG award is an award that's um, given by the, uh, the Queen to uh, foreign diplomats who've done exceptional work. Uh, and the image actually is in the bottom right hand corner of that slide. You might not be able to see it if it's really tiny, but um, I need to say you will all get a copy of this presentation as well. So, uh, you know, be able to look at this in more detail in your own time. But that image is of a, um, a what looks like a white um, angel um, with its foot on the neck of what looks like a black man. Uh, so very much the imagery of in which um, George Floyd was was murdered. Um, and so we uh, we led a campaign around that, which is ongoing. There's also a couple of articles that I've written. Um, some of you may have read those. Again, when you get this presentation, you'll be able to click on those links and it will take you to those articles. Um, there I talk specifically about how anti-racism relates to social work, but also um, 
how anti-racism can be um, implemented and um, uh, I guess employed in a broad sense within social work more than it is. Um, there's a number of podcast interviews um, uh, and webinars that I've been involved in in discussion uh, around anti-racism and we also have uh, an equality diversity inclusion advisory group as well as the black and ethnic minority professional symposium which is made up of social workers from various disciplines um, it's an online uh, space for uh, social workers to be able to offload and network uh, but we also uh, have plans to mobilize and address some of the inequalities uh, within social work moving forward I'll not dwell on that slide uh, anymore because I'm conscious of time. If I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. This slide um, is in relation to Black Lives Matter uh, and just to underline really that Black Lives Matter is about black lives needing to matter more than they have done. Um, they're not valued equally um, uh, and white lives have always mattered. And the response of all lives mattering um, well, um, in, in response to BLM, I don't feel it's comparable or, or really relevant as it's a little like asking what about colon cancer during a discussion about breast cancer, for example, um, uh, or uh, advising a bereaved mother that all lives matter at her child's funeral. Uh, so again, just other analogies really to draw on the, uh, the whole kind of meaning really of Black Lives Matter, which isn't necessarily part of a political organization um some just to make that point um my other point on there is that white lives have always mattered as i've mentioned so to keep proclaiming that really pushes into the realm of white supremacy uh, or further into the realm of white supremacy black lives matter obviously has its critics uh, but to me it is unclear why a movement that promotes equality is demonized by some who vehemently claim they're not a racist I always wonder why it's singular, um, but why they're not a racist and advocate for freedom of speech. To me, there seems to be a, a contradiction there. So just to make that point. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this is the definition of anti-racism by Ibram X. Kendi, who wrote a book on how to be an anti-racist. And the definition is that anti-racism is a belief that all races and ethnic groups are equal and deserving of the same opportunities. But the most important part of anti-racism is the next step, which is to do something about the existing inequality. Anti-racism is the active dismantling of systems, privileges and everyday practices that reinforce and normalize the contemporary dimensions of white dominance. This of course also involves a critical understanding of the history of whiteness. If I could have the next slide please. So how much of a priority is anti-racism in social work? And again, as I say, you know, this presentation is broader than social work really, um, but how much of a prior priority is it uh, really? Anti-racism in social work must be fully considered and dismantled through collaboration with black and ethnic minority social workers in roles as experts with personal and professional lived experience. It really is just a question of how much of a priority is anti-racism in social work. I could have the next slide please. Anti-racism, so what, blah blah, yawn. Here are just a few quotes really um, that I've captured. Um, this presentation is usually far longer than this, I have to say, so I am going through a sort of whistle stop here. Um, so I do elaborate on this more normally, but just for the sake of brevity, I shall give uh, just outline a couple of these quotes. The first one of which is an Angela Davis quote. In a multifaceted racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist, we must be anti-racist. And I have altered that slightly, so do forgive me there. Um, the final quote, which I'll quote, is um, racism isn't getting worse, it's getting filmed by Will Smith of uh, Fresh Prince fame, for those of you who've watched that. Okay, next slide, please. Here is uh, a quick model, which you might not be able to see in any sort of detail if it's a very small image for you. But as I say, you will be able to view that when you get your copy of this presentation. 
um, but it gives an overview of the different types of white identity and I would argue that some of this is um, individual but also organisational potentially uh, you know it relates to both individuals and organizations in terms of where um, people are where organizations are and the next step in their journey towards anti-racism the next slide please here is another model outlining the four dimensions of racism uh, which are institutional structural internalized and interpersonal again there's more detail there which i'll not go into now but hopefully that uh, sort of reframes this uh, anti-racist approach in a different way. Next slide, please. Um, for the sake of brevity, I won't read all of this slide, you'll be relieved to know, but uh, this is a slide um, outlining the three typical organisational responses, that I believe, that are often deployed uh, or not deployed in, case, in the case of the first one where um, some organizations will keep silent around issues of racism and anti-racism. They'll just keep things the same, hope all this Black Lives Matter stuff just blows over. Um, this kind of paralysis of fear, it correlates with perceptions of white fragility, white privilege, white supremacy, uh, and so on. Um, where you can see uh, certain terms have been underlined in this presentation, when you get your copy of this, you'll be able to click on those links and it will take you to uh, different evidence bases around those for you to explore further. Uh, the second um, organisational response type is to publish lukewarm operational statements that recycle and regurgitate previous rhetoric on workforce unity with predictable and borderline offensive platitudes uh, and often proposing only superficial changes. Um, and again, I, I give a little bit more detail there, which I'm not going to now, but hopefully you get the picture. And the final type of organisational response is to publish an authentic anti-racism action plan outlining significant reforms uh, that commit to specific, measurable, achievable and realistic targets, of which there are a few suggestions on the next slide. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. The next slide, um, again, uh, it's quite wordy, but uh, I shall just cover the main points. It's the anti-racist uh, commitment framework, which is just a kind of um, an idea, I guess, that, that I've cobbled together, which I think is a kind of uh, a start, at least, in terms of moving towards anti-racism within organisations. Um, so the first is about accelerating diversity within the organisation. Um, then it's about educating, empowering and equipping the workforce at all levels. Uh, then it's about senior leaders leading by example in different ways and also building in elements of transparency in terms of data collection and the use of data. If I could have the next slide, please. Wayne, sorry to interrupt. We just we will need to just move to a con in about a minute. No problem. Thank you. So the next slide. That. That's fine. I could rattle on all day. <laughs> The next slide um, is another model about becoming an anti-racist. Again, it outlines moving from the fear zone through the learning zone to the growth zone. And again, you'll be able to look at that in more detail when you get your copy of this. Next slide, please. I'm not going to read this in any great detail, but you'll see again what my views are around what needs to happen nationally. And the most important fundamental aspect, I believe, is about reintegrating anti-discriminatory, anti-oppressive and anti-racist values into the professional and qualifying education and training standards for social workers. I'll end on that slide. There are one or two others. Um, could we just see the next one, actually, if you don't mind? I don't, I can't quite remember. Oh, yeah, we'll not, we'll not cover that. That's fine. But yeah, if that's all right, if that is helpful, I'm happy to end there. Wayne, thank you so much. Um, thank you for providing um, a kind of condensed and yet very rich version of a much longer presentation, um, which I know that you are um, speaking widely on this. And um, it's fantastic that you were able to share that uh, all that with, with our participants as well. Thank you so much. In the, behind the scenes, I was slightly negotiating um, with Namal about stealing a bit of her time. So she's not too surprised to be running slightly later. We will make Sorry, up no time man. there. No, no, not at all, not at all. I was, I was wrapped. Um, over to Nimal, and uh, please don't don't overly censor yourself. Please uh, do your presentation, there, Nimal. Thank you. We'll take a bit time time back in questions. Brilliant. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks for inviting me um, to talk today. Um, my presentation is quite brief. I just really wanted to update everyone on some activity that's going on from the Office of the Chief Social Workers. So some of you will be aware that in NHS there is a workforce race um, and equality standard, which is in its fifth year. Um, and all the data is published um, for the world to see. We don't have that in social care. Uh, we, and so the project that I'm working on is um, trying to develop some of that. If I could have the next slide, please. So for those of you who um, either are not familiar with the NHS res, um, what it involves is organisations submitting data reports on an annual basis around a particular set of metrics. So in the NHS, there are nine metrics. And I would say if people haven't had a look at the NHS res, it's really interesting. If you just put NHS res into your favourite search engine, it's the first thing that comes up. And um, it does, it's, it's quite fascinating reading. So I would encourage you to kind of have a look at that. Um, the purpose is to, it highlights disparities and particularly experiences between white and black and Asian and minority ethnic staff. And these here on the slide are some key areas for focus for the NHS res. Some of the things that we've heard other presenters kind of touch on today. Um, so we're trying to look at the NHS res to look at which metrics can easily be pulled across into social care, which ones need to be slightly tweaked or, or which ones need to be completely rewritten with a view to um, having 10 to 15 local authorities. where we're starting with local authority social services departments as a first step. So from April, so we're in the process at the moment of um, uh, inviting local authorities to express an expression of interest to become one of those 15 local authorities to um, be the sort of initial sites really who are going to submit the data. The data, we will start collecting the data from April of next year. So that kind of initial phase will be one year, that's the plan at the moment. And there'll be some evaluation um, and some engagement events during that time. Um, and, you know, I say it myself, well, data's great, so what? <laughs> you know, we really want to make sure that we have a kind of um, improvement and action focused plan so that it's not just about the data sitting somewhere, but organisations the governance is such that the organisations are held to account um, on their action plans and on their improvement plans um, and really try to think about whether there are any regional patterns or, you know, some analysis of the data in the action plans. Next slide, please. So what we're looking for and what's going to be really important um, for this piece of work is of course, senior leadership and endorsement from the organisations, from social service departments, leadership at the very top have got to champion this. That includes all the kind of governance lines that I just spoke about. Um, we know that the data collection in local authorities is patchy, maybe. Um, there are lots of, there are different challenges from the NHS who have one system. Um, we have HR departments and data analysts uh, sections who have a variety of different software. Um, there's not one there's not one way of gathering this data, so it's a bit more of a challenge for social work um, and social care. It's going to be important that the local authorities coming forward um, have some good, strong project leadership and maybe identify a lead that can communicate directly with us and then back out to the workforce. Um, and what we really want to see from uh, those coming forward is their commitment to staff engagement. And I've just been thinking today, actually, 
about how we um, as a team uh, in the Chief Social Workers Office need to perhaps engage the workforce as well to kind of hear what some of the challenges are. So what I mean by that is, you know, I'm hearing that some uh, Black, Asian and other minority staff are saying, well, what happens to my data? Why should I, you know, why should I submit, tell you these things? What's going to happen to it? So I think it's really important that we hear what some of the challenges are, and what some of the I don't know, maybe fears are, um, but unless we kind of engage meaningfully, we won't really have a chance to kind of understand that. Um, and that then, of course, links out to the communities and the people who are actually using the services. So we're really interested to hear from local authorities how they'll be um, engaging with them as well. Um, I think that might be it. Is there next, one more slide? Next slide, please. Oh, yeah, timeline. So this is where we're at um we we hope to have the initial sites uh, local authority sites confirmed by the end of the year um and then there'll be a, a set of activities like the engagement that i just spoke about between january and march and as i said previously the the sites the, the initial sites will start from um, april uh, 2021 and run for a year and during that year i think we will need to look at what the challenges are in having a res for the wider social care um, sector, not just kind of social services departments. And we'll be looking at what that means for um, commissioning groups um, and how maybe we could we could work with that. So that that's that's the sort of next stage, really. Um, I think that might I said that last time. I think this might be it. One more slide. Is there one more slide? No, that's it. So that's my kind of brief update. So kind of watch this space. Please talk to your teams about it. Talk to your leaders about it. Um, and yeah, um, I'll look for any questions in the chat that I might uh, be able to answer. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. I'm already and uh, it's a really powerful development and lots to do, <laughs> huge amounts to do, but uh, really important that people know it's happening. Uh, and the importance of data, good use of data, how important that is, um, getting that right. Thank you. Um, now delighted to introduce Rene Allion, a PhD student from the University of York, uh, who you uh, met briefly uh, in the first half, uh, to tell us about um, her research. And uh, uh, Rene is a, is a researcher and a social worker and researching AMPS um, and practice. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks, thanks everybody, thanks for the listening audience. Um, today I'm going to just give a whistle stop to um, about my research journey um, from my BA um, straight up to my PhD which is very much focused on AMPS and the Mental Health Act and the um, over-representation of Black and minority ethnic people um, compulsory detained. Um, as highlighted, next slide please. Right, as highlighted from the discussions today and from my research, um, many have argued that racial stereotyping of black people, racism and cultural ignorance and the stigma associated with mental illness when experienced together may undermine the way in which mental health professionals such as AMPS respond to and assess the needs of black service users. Coercive pathways to mental health services um, when experienced by black service users are often directly linked to their disproportionately higher rates of compulsory detention under the Mental Health Act. However, alternative views in, including stigmatized attitudes towards help seeking within black and minority ethnic communities, differing cultural health beliefs about mental health, and also assumptions about like wider drug use amongst minority ethnic groups suggest that mental health inequalities are likely to have a complex cause and we acknowledge this. And where my research comes in, little is known, as Ruth, um, as we were discussing earlier, little is known about the impact of institutional factors such as organizational and professional culture and practices within adult mental health services. And as a social worker, these issues are of central importance to me. And I hope to address this gap in knowledge through my PhD research by examining the operational and institutional structures within the role of the social worker AMP and how this um, can influence, um, if it influences at all, the process of compulsory detention of 
black um, service users under the Mental Health Act. So I'm just going to give a, a quick journey um, as how I came to my PhD research. Next slide, please. Um, my BA social work dissertation was a systematic review that addressed the research question, what is known about barriers to accessing adult mental health services um, for BME groups in England? Um, the slide will show you my methods. Next slide, please. And the findings, these are how I presented my findings. Um, the findings revealed a barriers to BME people accessing mental health services, um, such as discrimination, stigma, and mistrust of services, professionals, lack of understanding of cultural and faith issues, and lack of talking therapies. And as you see, this revealed a web of relationships that potentially had reciprocal links between other possible um, combination of barriers. It was it was really a challenge for me to sort of express my my the results of my study because everything was sort of interrelated. Next slide, please. And the conclusion and implications um, for social work from my um, undergrad research was um, that adopting social approaches to mental health care and promoting direct pathways to services through self-referral self and expanding intercultural competences, as was discussed earlier by some panelists of professionals, may improve equity and access to mental health services for BME um, groups. Next slide, next slide, please. For my master's in social research, I still went on, I was still curious, and I conducted a qualitative study which sought the perspectives of social worker amps to find out how can mental health professionals mitigate the overrepresentation of BME people compulsory detained under the Mental Health Act? And I spoke to 10 social worker AMPs um, from two local authorities to, to answer this research question. Next slide, please. And my findings revealed interrelating factors such as emotional labor, lack of resources, risk aversion, and discrimination. Um, these were the opinions of AMPs really that implicated, that was implicated in the disproportionate detention of BME people under the Mental Health Act. So I was still curious again, and I wanted to go on with my research. Next, next slide, please. So the implications from, from my master's research and the conclusion I came to is that for social, so for social workers, um, mitigating the phenomenon of overrepresentation of BME people detained under the Mental Health Act requires collaborative, collaborative multidisciplinary, and multi-agency approach. And AMPS can play an, a significant role in this process, but there needs to be also fundamental improvements in the socioeconomic conditions for BME people. So it wasn't just a problem with AMPS alone. It's a socioeconomic problem. There was multi-agency work needed to be done in order to address this. Next slide, please. So I'm now on to my PhD thesis and building, as you see, there's a, a pattern going on. Building on my previous research findings that I just told you about, my current PhD research will use institutional ethnography as a qualitative method of inquiry to answer the guiding research question. How do the operational institutional structures within the role of the social worker AMF influence the process of compulsory detention of black service users under the Mental Health Act? And institutional ethnography is premised on, premised on accomplishing social change for disadvantaged groups by revealing anomalies between institutional policies and actual practice. Next slide, please. And by making use of this innovative research method, I hope to describe the ways in which the role of social worker AMPs conducting sectioning processes under the Mental Health Act is structured and operationalized. I will examine the challenges this poses on social worker AMP's ability to make independent decisions, seeking the least restrictive alternatives, and bring in a social perspective to bear on their decision. My study will focus on the impact on Black service users, as we can see, a specific and significant disparities in rates of mental illness, detention, treatment, and outcomes for this particular group. Persists. Next slide, please. All right, so I discussed the research question. You could go to the next slide, please. And I, next slide, please. Yeah. I will be adopting institutional ethnographies, com common methods of data collection, which will include observing and shadowing and interviewing AMPs. I will also examine the written policies and procedures in order to learn how things work 
within these AMP services that I'm going into, as well as my own reflections. After all, I am a BME social worker. These methods would be used to explore how the work of social worker AMPs is systematically coordinated through a complex convergence of national and local policies and procedures. Next slide, please. This is the first institutional ethnography of its kind in the UK. The findings of this study could potentially be used to demonstrate the complex work processes of integrated mental health and social care systems, enabling AMPs to see the systemic processes that mediate their work. This could represent a substantial and original contribution to the knowledge base of Black mental health and practice-based social work research, which may provide a unique insight into the phenomenon of overrepresentation. This information, as you know, is crucial for AMPs, social work, service users, and other professionals and policymakers within Britain's mental health system. Next slide, please. I'm just going to give you a quick timetable. So I'm in the second year of my research. I'm hoping to actually start my field work. COVID kind of came in and kind of messed up a lot of things, but I'm hoping to go into my AMP teams early next year, once we're not on lockdown, and my research is funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. So um, it's, it's due to be finished in September 2022. Next slide, please. And of course, I would love to hear from anyone. I'm going into, I've um, contacted two AMP services because I, I didn't want to just interview um, some one particular service. I need to come, kind of compare culture and stuff from two services. So of course, um, I live up north, I live in Yorkshire, so the two teams that I'm going to be engaging with are from up north, and uh, my contact email is there, and I'm on Twitter, and I will be putting updates on my research on Twitter ever so often, so you can see my journey, and I would love to hear from any AMS and social workers that may have may want to discuss this or are interested in my research. Thank you, everyone, for, for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rene. That's um, so interesting. And it's uh, actually really fantastic to have that progress from doing your BA, doing your MA, moving on to be a PhD, do a PhD, being in practice and, um, you know, continuing with that fantastic sort of journey and that motivation to interrogate something so important um, and getting uh, social workers and social workers, from, you know, all parts of the professional diversity into research is actually another one of the kind of areas of breaking through barriers that we so it's fantastic to have you here thank you um we're running slightly we're running slightly over but we've still got time uh, thankfully for some uh, a few of the questions that people have um kindly shared um so i would quite like to just pick up on um a few of those if that's okay um and um there was, uh, did I, sorry, yes, what, what was a question about, um, which I think kind of is relevant to, to kind of all speakers in a way, it's about anti-racism training for within the AMHP education, a AMHP training and, and, and ongoing um, refresher training, um, and then a linked question about unconscious bias um, and how that affects uh, perceptions of AMPs of the people that they're working with. Um, particularly around kind of different groups of people being considered more more dangerous, yet with similar behaviours and so on. Um, I, Ahmad, I wonder whether to just come to you because when we were preparing for this, we did talk about um, the role of the ongoing training that is a statutory requirement for AMPs, the refresher training, and how that might be expanded to, uh, and, and this could be an absolutely crucial topic for the ongoing uh, education and CPD um, for, for AMPs and, and, and whether that's happening. I don't know whether that happens within the definition of refresher training. You're, you're muted, uh, you're on mute, Imad. <laughs> um, I just go on to really relay my personal experience. I think as a profession, we have been complacent and have much more to do to cultivate equality, diversity and inclusion um and that applies to our practice we have fantastic guidance within the code of practice um to safeguard and promote human rights of service users carers and significant others and of course we have the principles that are like audit tools but what if, if and when used uh, and utilized appropriately then we can move on and achieve things. Um, 
but we know the principles are not statutory. However, the um, the independent review recommend uh, that for a principle will be statutory and hope that will be um, um, implemented in the future. So yes, I, I, I agree. I think, in my opinion, um, we have more than being complacent. I think we really need to address um, anti-racist and anti-oppressive practices and recruitments and operations and education and training. We need an overhaul and re-evaluation and re-examination of what we do and what we're doing, really, to, to move forward. Um, and, 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 and the black, as I mentioned earlier on, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, have brought that explicitly. And, uh, and in a sense, I've always been vocal and assertive, but it made me to be, be, be more more vocal and confident to say, enough is enough. You know, stop having these tokenistic uh, policies and guidance. Let's 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 make them real happening. Let, let's let's translate them to reality. Let's let's see how it's making difference. To to be honest, I, I am a practicing amp, and every time. I come across in assessing a service user from black and ethnic minority background, I come across a form of discrimination. If I identify it and I pick it up, I'm sure other AMPs can identify it and challenging it. But we need to have the structures around us where we can actually feel confident and safe where we actually address discrimination or racism without being stigmatized and, and so on and so forth. I have to stop myself. I'm very passionate about this, but thank you, Ruth, for bringing me um, uh, to, 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 to make my point. So maybe other members of the panel can say something. Thank you. Thanks, Ahmed. Yeah, um, I know Mark wanted to come in, there may, and there may be others as well. Did you want to come in there, Mark? Yes, I mean, Imad's point was brilliant, and I just wanted to share with everybody, you know, some, one of the many conversations that I had with people who were engaged in the Mental Health Act review, and uh, there was a lot of service user involvement in the Mental Health Act Review. And there was a specific black and ethnic minority group that advised Simon Wesley and his team. And one of the things that they said, and they said it in a very challenging, but also in a very constructive way, was they said, we understand that all AMPs are very well trained in anti-discriminatory practice. And most AMPs are social workers who have had a huge amount of basic training in anti-discriminatory practice and every time you do AMP approval you have to write as part of your portfolio all about the effect of, of race and culture so what their challenge to us was as social workers and AMPs was we know you're really really good at anti-discriminatory anti-racist practice and yet you've got this big job to protect people's human rights and look for the least restrictive practice and yet the numbers of black and ethnic minority people being detained going up. Now, they didn't say that in a blaming way. They didn't say it's your fault. But what they wanted us to do, I suppose, was be more challenging of ourselves and the situation that we're in about how we can, what, what can we do about that? You know, what can we constructively as AMPs, social workers, leaders of AMPs and social workers and practitioners do about that? And of course, it's very complicated because we have to look at prevention, we have to look at why people get to that stage where they're in front of an AMP being very, very unwell, and the number of legally appropriate uh, choices that that AMP has to make is very very limited. How did they get there? What was the intervention beforehand? What less discriminatory alternatives are on hand for that AMP? So it isn't all just on the shoulders of the AMP, but it really seemed like an important question to me to ask that of us. And that goes back to our training. It goes back to the Mental Health Act review and how we're supported by the mental health. It goes back to the core stuff that Rene is looking at. Because the other shocking thing that I found from being involved in the review was there was hardly any research on the actual process of being detained by an AMP. There's loads of research from when you first get into hospital and from your first assessment by the, by the nurse and all of the work that goes on, but there's hardly any research about assessment um, as a mental health out review. So I think there's an awful lot where, that we can do ourselves to change and develop uh, the way that the process takes place. So that was just something I wanted to say. Can I just briefly come in there, Mark? Um, and just to reiterate that 
we need to rely on empirical research as social as social workers as well. You find when we mix with people from the medical model, they have lots of research to sort of um, push their ideas in, and we tend to to not rely so much on qualitative research as social workers and I fell in love with research in, in qualifying to be a social worker and that's the way forward when we have the evidence through research like the research that I'm doing but when we ask for change and we lobby for change and you know we, we have the evidence that we've done the work we've done the groundwork you know so that's why I want to co-produce a lot of my research with professionals I'm not there to just say you know my opinion we, we, we interact with each other, we interact with the service users and we get the empirical evidence to make a change, you know? So I think that's important in social work. Thanks, Rennie. Um, so. I was just thinking, um, I was gonna to come to Wayne actually, if it's okay. I was thinking, cause Wayne, you're not from the AMP world. No, not so really. I was I, just thinking about some of those things that were being said and I've got a few thoughts. Yeah. The AMP world, kind of perceiving what mm. happens and you've been working closely with our mental health group so you got kind of a bit closer to it i guess mm. but from you know stuff that you were bringing forward the very important um presentation that's gone down uh, very very well with our um people feeding in comments they'd like to hear more so we will make that possible if you're <laughs> yeah um but i wonder what your commentary is on the you know your concerns about anti-racist social work and then seeing what happens within amp work have you got any comments on that yeah, I've, I've got to be honest and say that my approach to anti-racism in social work is a generic one as opposed to a specialist one. So I feel it applies to all areas of social work or where social workers are, are based. Um, but I'm, I'm trying not to kind of uh, splinter it off in any particular direction deliberately, really, because I think that's happened a lot over the years with social work. But that's a different different story. To answer the question more directly around um, what can be done. I think I perhaps look at it slightly differently as well, in the sense that I think, um, you know, a lot of what's been talked about today is obviously the impact on service users or patients, clients, and so on, uh, which is, you know, rightly so. It's why, why we're all here. But my approach, really, in, in terms of anti racism that I've focused on, has been more about practitioners and the impact on black and ethnic minority practitioners and professionals, and social workers, and so on. And um, I think, whilst ever, there's such inequality for the workforce how can we expect to get positive outcomes for service users whilst ever there's not um people of color in senior roles who are influencing and shaping the direction uh, of, of uh, you know service delivery nationally and locally um how can we expect to ever really address that issue because if we liken it to some of the wider issues in social work let's say in terms of um, people being really busy and not, you know, having huge workloads and not having time to have the quality time that they need with their service users to assess them, support them, et cetera, et cetera. That situation becomes even more complex when you look at it through the lens of um, racism and anti-racism, because there's all of that to take into account as well. Um, and there's a kind of uh, an understanding, I guess, that there's all these kind of barriers and difficulties generally for social workers and other practitioners, but there's less of a recognition for the impact on racism for uh, black and ethnic minority professionals and what they have to kind of work through in just in order to do their roles. Um, so that's the, the direction or the perspective that I uh, look at some of this. Uh, in terms of what can be practically done, which is what I, I like to uh, get, put my focus on in uh, with regards to anti-racism. I think there's lots of practical things that can be done. It's just whether there's the will. Uh, I think in terms of recruitment, um, in terms of uh, operations, how services are delivered, um, in terms of education for the workforce, people at all levels of an organization, uh, in terms of anti-racism, uh, in terms of allyship, there's all sorts of different things that can be done, and I can happily talk here all day about that stuff. I probably haven't probably, probably haven't got time, uh, but the reality, I think, fundamentally, it comes down to: is there the actual will? And if there's the will, then there needs to be a kind of discussion around making some of this mandatory for employers and, and social work organisations and social work employers and so on. You know, we can't really have one without the other. I don't think. Sorry if that was a, a long-winded um, answer. No, it was really, really uh, well, really helpful. Thank you. Um, 
I was wondering, um, for four purposes of time, whether to ask um, Robona and Nimar if you'd like to each maybe take a minute to reflect on anything that we've been talking about. I know Robona's yeah. Okay, yes, I would like to add something. Um, I think I mentioned when I started to talk about the VAMP, I said we are involved in individuals' life when they are in mental health crisis. And sadly, at that point, although we understand everything and we do not want to add the numbers or make an application, we cannot undo a lifelong of social injustice that someone has gone through their lives at that moment in time. Um, so I, I don't want for, for us um, to be seen as kind of, we are the one who detain people, we are the one that are discriminating in a way, because it, it is just one point of someone's life when they are in crisis. We, we need to be more involved in preventative work and working very closely with all organization communities and, and can make some changes, of course. But I think at that time we are extremely limited and, and we do think very carefully. And I, I do sometimes talk with my colleagues that are from black ethnic minorities and say, why are we doing this? How, how are we doing it? And we reflect and we say there's nothing else. We, we check and we explore everything, but at that time, there's nothing else. And, and we have to make those decisions, which are quite difficult. And there's also Thanks. the issue about whether it's a resources issue as well, both pre preventative resources and resources in, in that at that point yeah. of crisis. It's never yes. to be linked, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Robona. Um, Nimal, did you want to come in? Yeah, it's really interesting. I'm not from the AMP world either. So it's very interesting that I was picking up on very similar things to what Wayne talked about. And one of the things I've sort of written down um, is, you know, the thing about unconscious bias is quite often it's very conscious. Um, and that is really prevalent. And we're hearing more and more about that. But my when I was listening to everyone, I was really thinking about the workforce. That's, that's, you know, I've been in kind of social work reform for the past 10 years. So I'm thinking about, you know, how do who gets opportunities to be to become amps? Um, what's the recruitment and selection process? How, how do people get supported when they're in role? Um, you know, we're hearing lots of stories about, you know, black people saying, you know, I'm so busy, I don't have capacity because I'm having to prove myself, work extra hard, not, not drop the ball. And so therefore, I want to be an amp, but actually, I don't have capacity for that. And actually, that organisational responsibility of, you know, um, understanding the layering of oppression of black people. So I'm talking about you know, um, at the bus stop, in when you drop your child off to school, when you come to work, when you're on a Zoom call, when you go to the corner shop, and actually that impact of racial trauma that we carry around with us all the time. And then we think about kind of sickness and, you know, people off with headaches or chest pain or, you know, all of those things that we know happen. And I think only now people are becoming alert to some of that and thinking, actually, this isn't because this person is just off sick again or is being difficult, but actually they're, bit, they're traumatized. They're traumatized by everyday life and then also traumatized by feeling perhaps helpless um, in working with, uh, you know, all the things that we've just been saying. Of, oh, there, there actually aren't the options and resources that they feel that they know um, would be valuable to, to help people. So that that's what I've been kind of reflecting on as I've been listening to all the speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Namal. That's a really powerful place to finish the um, this this discussion part of of the whole session. I think so. Thank you, um, and, and thank you all very much. Um, we had. We had a number of other points that were raised, um, and one of them actually relates to that point, Nimal, which is about the number of amps from black and minority ethnic um, backgrounds. I don't have an immediate answer to that. I'm going to go to Emad and Mark in a minute to, to finish up, and there might be an answer <laughs> from one of them, but that whole issue about who gets to take on this role and who gets the pathway, the career pathway to take it on. 
um, is a really important point. So um, I'm going to finish at this point and, and just and ask um, uh, Imad and Mark to, between you, you're going to just talk about next steps and some final comments on the things that are happening and things that are going to be happening. So whichever would like to go first. Mark, um, okay. you Mark. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Ruth. Um, just to say, I don't have the exact statistics in front of me, but uh, the Skills for Care do an annual uh, workforce um, data uh, research section on, on AMPS. And we know that the um, the number of black and ethnic minority AMPS is slightly smaller than the uh, average for social workers, um, but it's growing each year. Um, but it's not, it's not, and AMPS tend to be, I suppose, um, slightly older and slightly whiter and slightly more male than the average social work population, if you see what I mean. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, but getting on to what we do next, I mean, I think this has been a fantastic kind of event, loads of really interesting things. Great to hear it. I think from my point of view, obviously, there's a lot happening at the moment. Uh, the RES programme that Nimal's involved in is so exciting, and I really support that. And I support the PCREF, and I want the AMPS to be really involved in that as well. But I think we've got this huge opportunity to have a lot of debates over the next few months and years around how we influence the Mental Health Act review and how we influence the development of Social Work England and how we and how AMPS themselves um, take responsibility and take power back over their own role and, uh, and, and work out where they want the AMP role to go in the future with all the things that have been said so far. I won't repeat them. And I think that um, we, those of us who are you know, involved in government or, or Social Work leadership, we want to be really supporting that and we want to be creating opportunities for AMPS to have that discussion and we want to be um, supporting more people to do the kind of research that Rene is doing uh, and all of this is one great big package if you like I suppose uh, and I've hard, it's hard to see how we can do without any bit of it really so that's what I'd like to leave everybody with um, and uh, see what what Imad would like to add to that. Um, yeah th th thanks Mark. Um, I just like to revisit um, what I started with. Um, this has been a, a fantastic, fantastic event with huge thank you to, to you, Mark, um, Department of Health, um, Chief Social Worker Office, and as always, the fantastic support from Ruth Allen. She's been amazing over the last 10 years, personally. But really what I want to focus back, focus us back on is this has been formally the launch of the Black and Ethnic Minority AMP Forum. And it's basically the aims and objectives really encompasses everything we talked about today. Um, it's about promoting opportunities for uh, BME AMPs, um, in leadership, development, research. So you um, you're very more welcome, Rina, and I. And I know of so many Black academics aspiring, being in touch with me with research ideas. So hopefully we can support them with your help, Ruth Bazwa, and 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 Department of Health and Chief Social Worker Office. I think the future is a brighter. Um, and thanks to the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and um, of course, I just want to say. Um, it is a matter of urgency to, pri to really prioritize the health of AMPS um, with focus on black and ethnic minority staff, given what we know um, about coronavirus. I did send an urgent email to the AMP lead network, remind them of this. Um, AMP leads need to, com need to um, communicate with their senior management to um, um, to start developing guidance and partnership with the trusts and partners um, to support um, AMS and to ensure they practice safely and to ensure the safety of AMS as well as the, the, the service user they work with, the carers, the families. It's important. Um, also, I think it's an opportunity. Uh, you mentioned that, Mark, and how can we develop the AMP role in order to promote human rights, address racial disparity, improve black and ethnic marriage service users 
you know, outcomes, including reducing detention. I think this is an opportunity um, of re-evaluation and rethink of how do we de develop the, the role further. I, I personally think AMS do a fantastic job. Uh, uh, my background was children and family. And what attracted me is that human right base, that passion for social justice within the mental health social work role and the AMPO. So really, um, that's what attracted me to the profession, the profession. But I think we need to press further to um, address these inequalities and disparities we mentioned in this um, and, and this webinar. Um, um, and I really would like to, um, you know, um, uh, promote the forum that has been launched. And I am keen to hear from as many uh, Black AMS to join uh, and will be supported in a comfort, you know, in a, com in a, in a safe environment uh, where they can voice their concerns um, and they can, be, you know, be supported. They have very um, supportive team around me. I will be chairing that forum for the next 12 months. I have a fantastic team around me, Steve Chamberlain, uh, Jill Robinson from um, Anfield and Haringey, and Abu Bakr, who is a from Westminster, I'm pleased from Westminster. I've got a fantastic group around me to, to take this forward. Again, thank you very much, and I'm really, really much appreciated for this fantastic opportunity. I hope we make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to everybody. We're going forward. There's much more to do. This is just the beginning, and you've, you've heard many things first here. There's much more to come. Thank you very much for joining us, all participants. Thank you, all contributors. See you all soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye.